Well, good evening, everybody. I'll let conversation to wind down. Well, tonight we're going to... Whoa, that's loud. Um, that sounded like the voice of God all the time. Um, I, I got to look... Do you remember when we started Revelation? Yeah. The date we started Revelation? It was in October. And here's the thing about me and Revelation. I hate dragging it out. And so I got to looking at uh, our schedule for Sunday evenings. And Sunday nights, I mean... We always uh, have a lot of stuff going on, which is great. And so, um, like, the uh, 31st is Fancy Schmancy Bingo, which uh, you have to read the announcement in the bulletin to kind of get it. Just read it over again, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and, then, um, and then the next week is uh, our Super Bowl Fellowship for uh, fundraiser for missions this year. And then the next week is Valentine's Banquet. So that means there will be three weeks or either we'll have to pause Revelation again, or uh, what we're going to do is tonight I'm going to hit one of the main issues, theological issues of Revelation, and then next week I plan to uh, talk about problematic symbols, characters, and other things in Revelation that might cause you to scratch your head, and I'm just going to make you scratch it more. And then that's going to be it for Revelation. Um, I'd like to spend more detailed time in it uh, with maybe a... It might be a subject for a special Sunday school class, discipleship group, or when we have a, a longer lick of time uh, to do it. But uh, it, it's one thing I don't want to glance over, and so I just want to kind of hit some uh, important things tonight and next week. And then we'll be in Lent. And there's some things that I want us to do on Sunday evenings during Lent, uh, some special sort of uh, worship services, some uh, new, or not new, but some different traditions of worship, uh, my, my, I'll go ahead and tell you all because it's just, a, it's just us in here. Um, one of the reasons I want to do that is, as you know, we're in the search process for new uh, minister of music, families, and children. And one of the things that comes anytime you have someone new in any capacity is new ideas and new approaches to things. And I think it helps to go ahead and stretch, uh, get a little spiritual exercise, as it were, and stretch our minds and our, our ways of thinking and perspectives on worship. Uh, and Sunday evenings are a good time to do that, especially during the season of Lent. So we'll, we'll uh, be doing some different things, trying some different things on Sunday evenings in terms of worship uh, that I think you'll, I, I hope, you'll find meaningful. So, um, so that brings us back to Revelation. And I don't have any uh, PowerPoint tonight, so you got to try real hard to listen. And if I drone on and sound like I'm lecturing, throw a hymn book at me, and I'll pray and we'll go home. Um, but tonight we're going to look in chapter uh, 20, just the first ten verses of it, and something that is probably one of the more complicated ideas surrounding not just the book of Revelation, but really Christian eschatology, um, and that is the idea of the millennium. So as you're turning there, I want us just to uh, begin our time together tonight with a word of prayer. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, guide our thoughts tonight. Help us, Lord, as we study your word, as we uh, look to to understand the ways that we read it and the ways we look at it more clearly. God, help us to first and foremost put our love for you, our understanding of who you are to us and to the world first before anything else. So Lord, be with us tonight as we look now to Holy Scripture in this book of Revelation. In your name we pray. Amen. So let's look at chapter 20 in verses 1 through 10. John the Revelator writes, uh, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and locked and sealed it over him so that he would deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be let out for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and those seated on them were given authority to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony to Jesus and for the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ 
and they will reign with him a thousand years. When the thousand years are ended, Satan will release, be released from prison and will come out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, in order to gather them for battle. They are as numerous as the sands of the sea. They marched up over the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. You got it? Everybody know what it's about? Can we just go home? Is it clear? Or do we need to talk about it? Talk about it? Okay. Well, we're going to talk about some of these other things, like dragons and all this kind of stuff, uh, next week. But what I want us to talk about is this idea of a thousand years, uh, a millennium. This is one of the things that's been, uh, that has caused Christians and theologians to sort of scratch their heads uh, over the years as we look at Revelation, we uh, read about these things. And just like everything else in the Christian tradition, there are as many ways of interpreting it as there are people who are willing to interpret it. But when it comes to the millennium, there are basically four major ways of understanding it. One is called dispensational premillennialism, uh, these are also great words, by the way, if you're ever playing Hangman, or if you're wondering what letters on the Scrabble board you can use. Uh, dispensational premillennialism, historic premillennialism, postmillennialism, and ah millennialism. Those are the four sort of ways uh, to, that most people sort of tend to understand uh, the millennium. Now, we're going to talk about the first two, premillennialism, uh, dispensational and historic. Dispensational premillennialism, it's going to be hard for me to say that. Pre dispensation, because I used to say premillennial dispensationalism, but dispensational premillennialism is probably the most well known one, but only in America. And that's odd to me. Uh, not really, it's not odd to me at all. Uh, when I was over in Amsterdam, I remember this came up in one of our coffee breaks as these Baptists from all over the world we were talking. And one of them said, why do American Christians believe this premillennial nonsense? I said, well, I, that's probably, if you guys remember we talked about a guy named John Nelson Darby and Roger Schofield. That's probably because of them. And they said, yeah, we don't pay attention to those guys across the pond or in Africa or in South America, but only here in the States. And dispensational premillennialism has really taken off uh, since the likes of Hal Lindsey and, of course, the Left Behind novels. The way to understand dispensational premillennialism, it, man, that's just a lot to say, right, um, is, is it's this idea that Christ is going to return not once, but twice. And the first time he doesn't actually return. Christ raptures his church before a seven-year period of intense tribulation, and then he comes back and reigns for a thousand years. During this time, the devil is locked away in a pit, but when this time is over, the devil gets to come back out for however long amount of time, and then God judges all of the wicked and sends the devil away into the pit. Premillennialism of this sort, of this dispensational idea, takes on the idea of what's called dispensationalism, or dispensations. It's the notion that history is broken up into certain chapters. And of course, no matter whether you believe there are three or a thousand of these dispensations, which one do you think we are in? I'll give you the hint. It's the one that comes after the one before the last one. The last one. Right? No matter how many dispensations you think, we are in the longest one and in the final one. This is what most uh, dispensational premillennialists believe. Now, the way these people, the way, and I say these people, I'm going to say that all the time, not saying they're different or whatever, but just to give you uh, uh, just a way of talking about things. The way that dispensational premillennialists read, particularly Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 10, is with a strict sense of literalism. They sit down and go, okay, here's what happens. Whether it's crazy or not, we have to sort of put the pieces together and form a timeline of what takes place. And so they do that. That's why it, it's kind of odd. They say, well, Jesus comes back and raptures the church, which, by the way, the word rapture is nowhere. In scripture, we talked about that. It's nowhere. The only place rapture is mentioned is in the Latin translation of Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians when he says that we will be caught up in the air. And that phrase caught up 
It's raptura in Latin. And so people have taken that from the Latin text and said, oh, this is a rapture of sorts. Which that word beforehand really did mean that, like to be caught up really in an ecstatic joy. First time I heard that word uh, was in an odd place. It was the Wizard of Oz. The scarecrow actually says it. He says, oh, what joy, rapture. You know, it's like, oh, he's talking about Jesus coming back. Uh, and so that's, this is the sense of Jesus raptures the church. They disappear for seven years while everybody else has to go through this really difficult time. And the seven years comes from this idea, not from Revelation, but from Daniel, from the 70th week of Daniel. And during this time, the Antichrist reigns. And we're going to talk about the Antichrist or Antichrists later, but it's enough to know that uh, throughout history, everybody's been pegged with the title from Caesar to Oprah and everybody in between. And just about, so far, everybody has been wrong, right? And so uh, the notion is during this seven years of tribulation, the Antichrist will reign. At the end of the seven years, Jesus comes back a third time and then takes all of the church back into this glorious, uh, wonderful place. And then there's a thousand years where Christ reigns with the church. And at the end of that, Satan is uh, let loose. During that time, uh, he's judged, thrown into the lake of fire. And then, who really knows what? Like it, eternity happens. The way dispensational premillennialists view Scripture and also the role of Israel is very unique. For dispensational premillennialists, Israel and the church are two separate identities. Uh, Christian Zionists, anybody familiar with that, that movement? Christian Zionists typically fall in dispensational premillennialist way of thinking. Um, it's the idea that Israel is either a cryptext in understanding the, uh, the end times, they're the key to unlocking things. If we can get all the Jews back to Israel, if we can keep the nation of Israel together, if we can restore its historical boundaries, then Jesus will come back. And some of them believe that the Jews are saved because they are Jews and God's going to uphold their covenant with them. And some of them think, well, it doesn't matter if they're saved, they are the key to getting Jesus to coming back. Uh, they're unique in this understanding in terms of the four major ways of understanding uh, the millennium and thinking that Jews and Christians are separate. Jews, Israel, and the church are separate. And so uh, they're called premillennialists again because Jesus comes back before this millennial reign and then there's a thousand years and then Satan is tossed in the, uh, into the lake of fire and uh, Christ and the redeemed live forever and ever. You got all that? Clear as mud, right? All right, that's dispensational uh, premillennialism. The other premillennialist view is historic premillennialism or historical premillennialism. Uh, again, it's very similar except in two ways. The way they understand Scripture and the way they understand Israel. Uh, historic premillennialists believe that Christ does come back before the thousand-year reign. He shows up uh, and takes the church either here on earth and reigns with them in the new Jerusalem or reigns with them from heaven. The way that he, they understand Scripture is through this sort of grammatical, historical method. Rather than taking it literally and trying to make every passage fit, they read it from the grammar of, of what John is writing in the Greek and the historical understanding of this passage. For them, the church and Israel are not different. The church is the fulfillment of Israel. So therefore, Israel does not play some, uh, uh, some eschatological part in the second coming of Christ. The idea of the rapture, if there is one for historical premillennialism, is that the saints, both dead and alive, will come back to life, will be resurrected, to live with Christ during this millennial reign, um, immediately before it and all throughout it, and that this millennium will take place with Christ ruling with the saints here on earth, that there will be a reestablishment, probably of temple worship, uh, but not for the sake of sacrificing for sins, but in this sort of symbolic reference of what Christ has done uh, for, for us in his redemptive acts. So the main difference between uh, dispensational premillennialism and historical premillennialism is the way they understand Israel and the way they understand Scripture. Um, so I'm trying to think. I'm trying to, am I going too fast? I'm trying to cram it all in there because, frankly, I just like to get home for cold roast soup. Um, they also, uh, his, one of the other sort of key ways of understanding a historical premillennialism is that they do not believe in what's called an imminent return of Christ. An imminent return of Christ means Christ will come back any moment. He'll come back now, 
could come back a thousand years from now. But if those who hold to the historical view of premillennialism say no, uh, there actually have to be these sort of dominoes that fall in a sequence before that happens. That things have to happen before Christ can come back. And so they look at, uh, they look at the world, they look at history and say, here are these things that happen. They look at these other things uh, that may be laying out ahead of them and try to figure out how these things fit in to these historical events prior to Christ's second coming. So that's another key way to understand premillennial uh, ways of thinking that are different from postmillennial and amillennial. Everybody ke- keeping up? That will be a test at the end, I promise. Okay. Um, now, postmillennialism. When do you think Christ comes back from the postmillennial view? After, right? Postmillennial. Christ comes back after the thousand years. So, when did it begin? When does it begin? Yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> uh, postmillennialism, the idea is it either started at Christ's birth, at Christ's death, at Christ's resurrection, at Pentecost with the arrival of the saints, but sometime the millennium has already begun, and we are presently living in the millennium. That the, the view of postmillennialism is not that the world is going to get worse and worse and worse, and then there's going to be a rapture that lifts the church off of the world while it gets even worse, but that Christ has commissioned his disciples to make the world better. And so in Christ's absence, there is a millennial reign where Christ reigns in the spirit through the church and through the life of the saints who are presently on the earth to make the world better. Now, it's my opinion that this is not maybe Revelation's view of the millennium and of, of eschatology, but it seems most definitely to be the gospel's view of eschatology, especially Matthew's use of apocalyptic and Luke Acts. If you read Matthew, Jesus, what's the Great Commission say? Can somebody quote the Great Commission? Yeah, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I'm with you when? Always, or what's it literally say in another translation? To the end of the age, right? Matthew's apocalyptic falls in the post-millennial understanding. Christ has commissioned the saints to the end of the age, the end perhaps of the millennium when Christ will return and reign forever and ever with the saints and all evil, Satan, dragon, everything will be gone. And Christ will reign forever. Just full disclosure, let me see my cards. This is kind of where I land in the post-millennial camp. That Christ is, is already commissioned us to, to bring the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. This is what he prays for his disciples. And so post-millennials uh, tend to have this view, post-millennialists tend to have this view uh, of the, the millennium, the rapture. Uh, there is no, sorry, there is no view an understanding of the rapture, but rather that um, that what happens is Christ has commissioned us now to live here uh, and to bring the gospel on earth as it is in heaven. The way they understand scripture is through a covenant historical way of viewing scripture. In other words, they don't read Revelation 20, 1 through 10 and go, how do I make this all fit? But rather read Revelation 1 through 10 in the grand scheme of all of Christian scripture, understanding that through the covenantal language of the Old Testament, Christ's covenantal language of the Gospels and through the historical understanding of what takes place with the church from the very beginning and even the people of God. Here again, Israel and the church are not different. The church is the fulfillment of Israel. And the purpose of what we are doing is to make the world the kingdom of God, to make the world better. So the kingdom of God is in one way already here among us in a spiritual way. And so... Uh, the millennium also for post-millennialists is not a literal thousand years. Uh, that's, the, that's what trips you up a little bit, right? A thousand years. Because doesn't it sound weird when you think about it that Christ will return and then take the church away and then come back and then reign for a thousand years and then it's something... It sounds weird when you think of it that way, right? If Jesus is just going to come back and it's going to be there, right? That seems to be how it ought to be. It seems the way Jesus and Paul talked about it. Uh, but Revelation paints it a little differently. So post-millennials have to wrestle uh, with this a bit. And so finally comes the fourth view, which is amillennialism. Now, amillennialism, what does the prefix a mean? A. You know? Not. Yeah, it's negative, right? There is 
no millennial. So amillennialists believe that the kingdom of God was inaugurated at some point during Christ's life, most likely his resurrection, at which point when that happened, when Christ was raised from the dead, he had one victory already over Satan, over the power of sin, over everything. That what, re- what is being described in Revelation in these ten verses is what happened at the resurrection. Now, amillennialists tend to, to have to kind of fudge around with some, some scriptures, oftentimes ignoring some symbolic language, ignoring some things that are written therein. And so they, they say, well, this has already happened. There is no millennium. There's just eternity. And these are how things go. Their way of looking at Scripture is through what's called a redemptive historical view, that they're looking at every passage of Scripture through the realization that what Christ has done has settled everything, that there's no need for next steps, there's no need for other things down the road. For them, there is no separation again from the church and Israel, and the kingdom of God is a spiritual reality that takes place now and will be fulfilled not in, in this second coming and this institution of, of a new kingdom or of a millennial reign, but will happen in what's called the consummation. Christ will return. There will be a physical resurrection. Death will be no more. The way we kind of experience life now will cease and we will be a, in, involved in this consummation of reality when God and Christ will be real physically to us. We will be real physically to them and to each other forever and ever. Does that make sense? Kind of? Maybe? Okay. There is no rapture for all millennialists uh, there, because there's, there's no sense of a second sort of firing gun. There's no starting over again. The millennium has already happened. In fact, it's not real for them. It's, it's not something that's, that's really there. The millennium is a symbolic uh, idea that Christ has already started these things, and now they're just continuing on. Uh, they, they really rely heavily on what's called a two-age theology, the age before Christ and the Messianic age, which began with Christ and continues on forever after into the future. So there's the four views of the millennium. Any questions? Okay, good. I'll, that was good. I record time. Okay. Now, um, okay. I, I, yes, I knew it was coming. Mm-hmm. That's good. To God. For the earth people? Oh, I was like, the earth? Yeah. No. That's fine. We got time. I think that's it. I think that's all of it. Yeah. One like with God, one day is there. a thousand years is one day. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. One thing that's important to um, remember to we'll talk about this next week when I say problematic sort of symbols and numbers and things is um, it's kind of like uh, how long was Noah? How long did it rain? No in the ark. Forty days and forty nights. Is that a literal forty days and forty nights? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, when you when you you read it that way and go, yeah, and there's no re- reason to think it isn't. But at the same time, when you understand that uh, for the ancient Semitic people. When you wanted to say something happened for a long time, 40 was pretty high. I mean, how long did the Israelites wander in the wilderness? 40 years, right? Was it 40 days, right? 40 was a way of saying, eh, it was a long time. I mean, it's kind of like you say somebody say, how long have you been suffering with your back? Ah, about a month. Right, was it really a month? 
or was it, you know, about a month? Forty days away of saying a long time. A thousand years. Think about, I mean, even for us, can, we, can you imagine what 3016 is? Let's go with 3016 is going to be like. It's a long time. And so really it's a way of saying a long time. And this happens a lot. And again, we'll talk about this with, with numbers uh, and things next week. But, um, but that's, a good, that's a good thought there. But for God, a thousand years is a day. Right? And what will really melt your brain, I'm going to do it since we got time. Um, is to, to think of God. Uh, there, there, are two, there are a couple of ways. Of th- when you start to think about how we think about God, then you really start to kind of start scratching your head a little bit. Does God exist in time with us or outside of time with us? Ooh. Ooh. If, you're, if you're what's called an open theist, you believe God exists in time with us, which means God does not actually, while he may know the future, God does not exist in the future until the future happens. That makes sense. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just muddy in the water, right? But if God exists outside of time, hmm. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I want you to think about that. If you're, if you're having trouble sleeping at night, does God exist in time with us or outside of time? Because here, uh, here we got, again, we got time, so I'm going to tell you. And I, I think about this often, especially in light of when someone passes and when I'm thinking of doing funerals and things. And what do you say uh, to folks? Often we think of when someone dies, right, that their spirit goes on, floats up to heaven, and their body is laid in the ground. Believe it or not, the New Testament actually speaks directly against this idea. Uh, the New Testament, in fact, calls this a heresy. This is what the Gnostics believe, uh, that our body and spirit were separate. And so when we die, our spirit is separate from our body. Now, yes, Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, uh, but that, that, in its context, means something uh, slightly different from this sort of cartoonish way of thinking our spirits float. Today, you, uh, and this is where I'm going, this is where I'm going. And so... Um, if God exists outside of time, if, there's a, if time is a creation of God, man, this is really getting deep. I feel like Morgan Freeman should be saying something. Um, if time is a creation of God, when we die, who is to say that, or when someone dies, who is to say that we are not already present with them? Does that make sense? That when your last breath on this side of eternity uh, and your first on the other side is the resurrection. I actually take comfort in that, to know that uh, like when my grandmother died, it was in 2009, so almost seven years ago. Because I mean, I, I thought about it this way: like if I died tonight and got up there, grandma said, "Let me tell you what's happened in the last seven years in heaven." Like I missed something, right? Like something has happened in seven years in heaven. I tend to think that the next thing that happens is resurrection. That seems to be what Scripture sort of outlines: is resurrection is always the important thing. Is always what happens, and so. Um, and understanding things like the millennium, things like the rapture, things like um, how the end and our own ends and how the end of the world plays out, I think these are important things uh, to take into consideration. And so um, I wanted to, to spend just a moment, because Doyle brought it up, on the passage from First Thessalonians where the word rapture is actually uh, taken in Latin. And then chapter 3, and... Um, it begins, uh, let's see, uh, in verse 16 of chapter 4, excuse me. Uh, for the Lord himself, with the cry of command, with the archangel's call and the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven. So which direction is Jesus going? Down here. Will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, when we read that from with, with sort of the eisegetic approach from uh, John Nelson Darby and Roger Schofield, what we're reading is about a rapture, right? We'll be caught up in the air, and there we'll be living with God forever and ever. But remember, where was which direction was Jesus going? 
down. In Corinth, outside of the city, in fact, outside of most major Roman cities, was the cemetery, the necropolis, the city of the dead, was outside of the city. When the emperor came to visit the town, by the time he made it to the necropolis, everyone in town went out to meet the emperor. You went out to meet the emperor, the governor, or someone important was coming. You went out to meet them with the dead. And then you came into town with them. And there you spent your time with them in celebration and festivals or whatever. This is the image Paul is painting. That Christ is coming to us and we with the dead will rise and meet him and then come back to reign forever and ever. Now Paul, uh, 1 Thessalonians by the way, oldest book we have in the New Testament. A lot of ideas are not fleshed out by the time Paul has written this. Paul probably is still even wrestling with the notion that uh, there might be a trinity. Right? This, these things aren't really fleshed out for Paul. But this is what's happening. This is the imagery Paul is using. So uh, when, when Darby and others took the Latinized word raptura uh, and tried to make it about this, you know, naked people floating up in the heaven and leaving their clothes behind, um, I, I think that was, I think it was poor uh, exegesis, poor reading of the scripture. So just wanted to touch that for I forgot. Anything else? I will say this, like I said last time. I like the guy at, like the janitor at um, uh, 7th and James, I think it was. No, Columbus Avenue in Waco said, uh, I read it and I realized what it's about. In the end, Jesus wins. That's really the only thing that matters, right? Well, good. Well, well, let us pray. God, we thank you for even these sort of muddied waters of understanding Scripture and theology and the ways that we think about you. God, we know that sometimes our minds can get too caught up in these things. Too caught up in trying to understand how we are to understand. How we are to think. Lord, you simply call us to follow you. To trust that wherever you are leading us is where we need to go. So Lord, tonight as we've wrestled with some thoughts from Revelation, as we continue to wrestle with words and thoughts we have from scripture and the world around us and the troubles they may present us. Help us, Lord, to always keep you ahead of us. We may always be following after you, seeking to do your will, to bring your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh Uh-oh. Oh, yes. Yes. I think they're going to try to do it at 11. I mean, I, I, don't, think, I don't think the family would want us necessarily to cancel it. But, I mean, um, that's, again, always, that's, uh, for those of you who don't know, that's one of those things I kind of leave up to, to hear from you all about. Uh, I, yeah, it, it, it's, it's tough because I know, I mean, I know how things are. People you know, think that when church is canceled, it's because I want to go home and read the paper or something. Uh, but in this case, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think it would be a problem to have it. I think if it's at 2, we may not have supper just because uh, people might be around and uh, getting things. And, but uh, I, I don't see any problem. Anybody? I mean, I think if Ty were here tonight, he and Jill would say, you know, let's have, let's have it. So I don't know of a time right now. I do know visitation will be here Tuesday night. Um, and then service will be here Wednesday, uh, either at 11 or 2. That's usually when that happens. So, um, in fact, I'll probably stop in on the way home and see if they've heard anything. So, unless any of you've heard specific. Oh, okay, okay. Good. All right. Thank you.